My name is Elizabeth Agnew Cochran. I'm a professor of Catholic Studies and Theology at Duquesne University with a specialization in ethics. This video is the first in a series of conversations about what it means for autistic individuals to flourish and what assumptions need to be re-examined in order to create a more just society. I'm a Christian theologian, and my own views of what it means for humans to flourish are informed by that tradition. But the concept of flourishing is understood in different ways in multiple academic fields in the humanities and the sciences. In all of these fields, we can enrich and expand our views of what flourishing looks like by recognizing that neurodiversity is part of what it means to be human. The panelists who share their perspectives in this video, Sarah Scott Dietz, Joellen Marsh, Father Matthew Schneider, and Michelle Wright, approach the topic of flourishing by using their academic expertise to reflect on the nature of flourishing, their own experiences of neurodiversity, and their commitments to the Christian faith. I learned a lot from talking with these panelists, and I hope that you will as well. And I do think that there have been there has been a move now to do like sensory friendly masses or uh, the reverse cry room, which is basically like you took the cry room, turned down the volume, turned the lights in the cry room, so that that the back part uh, in most Catholic churches, I, I don't know about other denominations, have. A room in the back that's usually used for babies to cry in, so they aren't disturbing the rest of the congregation. We have a glass, you have a glass front out to the main church, but it's separate as far as how its sound is. It has lights in it, and you can turn those lights off, turn the the sound down, so that that can be a sensory friendly space. And it's so much so that an article uh, a few months back called it the you know the mainstream view. But then it's like I keep a directory on my website of like the the parish that are doing it, and there's 16 in the country on my website. I might not catch them all, but my suspicion is, you know, we're dealing with less than 0.1% of the parishes because, you know, we have, what, 20,000 parishes. And so, like, you know, 20 would be, you know, one one out of every thousand parishes. Uh, and I, you know, and that's probably a realistic ex ex uh, guess because I'm pretty aware of them, but I probably missed a few, you know. And 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 so I think there are places that are really doing that. And it's been a really joy when I've been able to celebrate mass there or helped out at, at one or two of them. Uh, but at the same time, that's really the exception. And I can understand that, okay, not every parish in a, in a city can do a sensory family mass like that, just logistically, because priests can only say so many masses on Sunday and things like that. But I really wonder when you have a whole metro area with, you know, hundreds of thousands of Catholics overall in the whole metro area, why well, there's not even one in the metro area. And that's and that's and that's where I really see on that very basic level, it's still not it's still often not being being not given that opportunity for the autistics who, you know, have to wear the loop earphones or some some of them can't even go to mass without something like that. Right. And 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 it's a very simple thing to do that can easily be provided somewhere in the in the in the city you know at least at the very least i i um there's some statistics out there that just kind of reaffirm what what you're talking about i mean i can speak on behalf of the you know the catholic church i think in 1978 was the first formal um statement put out by the bishops um calling the church to full inclusion calling the church to um incorporate everyone into the body of Christ, that missing one person is, is a diminished face of Christ. Um, when you look at, I mean, this is just in the United States, one in seven, one in six, I believe kids have some kind of disability. I think it's even higher for adults. Then that's gonna include um, autism, it's gonna include ADHD, it's gonna include um, developmental disabilities, you know, all, all the whole gamut, but, um, what, what I find frustrating is when very well-intentioned individuals want to have a mass outside of the typical celebration of mass for that community. Um, you know, there's lots of places that have the sensory friendly mass, maybe on a Sunday afternoon where, you know, individuals that might have a hard time 
you know, participating in a, in a typical mass that, well, they can go in and celebrate mass over here. And again, I'm, I know that that's very well intentioned, but it's missing the point. They're, they're part of the body of Christ and the body of Christ needs to be educated and welcoming to, to everyone and uh, every ability, every, everybody. Um, so I, I really wish, and this is an ideal, you know, dream of mine, but every parish, every parish should have one mass that is accessible, that is, you know, uh, intentionally welcoming to families who have kids that are really young and might not have the patience to attend, you know, might not have the ability to stay, stay quiet. I mean, if you have little kids, you know what I mean? Um, you know, we're, we're, we're the, the parishioners, like the ones who go, they know like the music is going to be a little bit lower. The lights might be a little bit lower. We don't need incense at every single mass. I, I, I love incense. I think it's great, but I don't think it needs to be used at every mass, you know, um, uh, where, where the senses, again, that are supposed to be heightened, you're supposed to be um, brought into worshiping the Lord with your, with your sight, with your sound, with taste, with smell, with everything, where that can be um, kind of made more accessible. And, and so that they're welcome and appreciated. And not only to participate in the Mass, but also to minister and to be a part of reading the readings. And, um, you know, greeting people as they come in and, and being ushers, um, please, God, can we get some more low gluten hosts? So it's not very difficult for those of us with gluten issues, you know, um, to be able to, to receive the Eucharist. Um, I think that there's a lot of things that we could do if we were aware, but here, here's what I have found is that, you know, a lot of people are afraid of making a mistake. They're afraid of offending someone. I mean, I, even as I'm, I'm speaking here as a, as a neurotypical individual, like I don't want to say something to, to upset anybody, right? But yeah. I think that with that fear come the easiest response is to just not do anything. Mm -hmm. And not doing anything is a decision in and of itself. And, uh, you know, passive omission, I mean, that you, you, can't, you can't claim that, you know? Um, inclusion has to be intentional. There has to be a plan and there has to be um, deliberate decisions made, not only by the pastor, but by the faith community to reach out to individuals, to say, what can we do? Every parish might have different needs, um, but there, there are individuals in every parish that need to be welcomed, need to be accepted for who they are. And they're usually really small, um, minor changes that when they're made, make a huge difference, not only for the individual, but for the family who needs to worship and who needs the support of a community. I think it's, it's interesting. There's, um, there's I, something I saw on Twitter and I wish I could go back and find the original tweet, I lost it and, but it, it was um, more about um, diversity and um, they were saying that, you know, traditionally the way that we approach trying to, you know, make a community multicultural or whatever is to take someone who is black or someone who is um, some other like racial minority and, drop them into the community and then that's it, right? Now they're there and it's mm -hmm. fine. And yeah. the point they were making was you have to change the, you're, not, you're then requiring that individual to do the work, to be the person mm -hmm. that makes the change to um, rather than the community. And they're saying, you know, you, you need to do the work first and then invite the people in and you mm -hmm. kind of get to a chicken and egg in some respect. However, I think it's applicable here too, because the idea to say, you know what, um, like as our church has done, um, we're going to build a sensory room. Nobody actually asked, really asked for the sensory. Well, I think some people brought it up, but it's sort of one of those, like, do you think this might be a thing? But then it just, 
if you build it, they were, will come, right? Like it's, so, yeah. it's there and it's being used. And there was sort of some discussion and like, talking to, you know, actually autistic people of like, what, what, what should this look like? Um, so involving them in the, dis- in the discussion, but not making them have to be the catalyst, not making them have to be the ones to, um, to make the, the determination of, of that there would be a room or they didn't have to push for it. They, they weren't necessarily the ones like, yeah. And I, I think that there's the other part of that. It, it it's akin to having, um you're, you're saying having small children in church or, or <laughs> having a baby in church, right? You're the brand new mom in church and you're like, <laughs> and it's completely different to be in a congregation where the baby makes a noise and everyone in the church turns around and they're like, oh, versus <laughs> the baby makes a noise and everyone in the church is like, why is that child? Yeah. Not- <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you know, when you're the mom and the baby makes a noise, like the entire energy around you to one direction or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the, the same can be said if you are a non-neurotypical person or you have a, a you have a, a kid or yourself and you just can't quite like get there or you're having a moment and you need to take out something and look at it or do something that's off script or whatever. And the people around you are like, what, what is happening over there? Yeah. Like, why is that person yeah. doing the thing that's not supposed to be done right now? maybe that person is having something going on with them that, that you don't understand and just take take a minute. It doesn't have to be autism. It could be they're having a medical issue or mm-hmm. their, their you know, loved one is having a medical issue and that's why they're looking at the phone in the middle of mass. Like there's right. just yeah. the job to yourself, right? And I think that really, really resonates for me, everything you just said. I think as somebody who's late diagnosed, I and many, many other people who are not diagnosed or who are late diagnosed and still figuring out their needs don't necessarily even know what to ask for. But Mm -hmm. having a church that says God loves everyone, God loves all of us, we welcome everyone here, we want to know what your needs are, you don't need to leave the sanctuary if your baby's making noise, you don't, if you have like you know, hearing issues, we're going to accommodate your hearing issues, just hearing those other com- accommodations and knowing that those other things exist. And that's the interest and the purse is excited to do that. That's made it easier since figuring out that I'm autistic of being like, oh, it's going to be okay. If I need to like walk out of the sanctuary for a few minutes, no, one's going to look at me funny. Cause no one looked at the three-year-old who was screaming or, you know, like, <laughs> you know, that's totally fine. And so having just that confidence and that trust in my church community that if, even if somebody did say something to me, it would, it would be corrected by the culture of the community. You know, I think that's what really helps me feel safe. I grew up in the Episcopal church in a very sort of high church, like very, (laughs) very traditional, like it was it was a big deal when we moved away from the 1982 hymnal to to add in um, like one other hymnal. Like if it wasn't in the 1982, then we weren't singing it kind of a thing. Like it was a big deal. Right. And um, and then I went I went to boarding school and it was very comforting to me to go to uh, Episcopal Church states away from where I had grown up and have the same words and the same Mm -hmm. music and the same, like everything Mm -hmm. is exactly the same. And even if everything else in my life has turned upside down, this is the same. And I can go in and I can get exactly the same thing and know what I'm walking into. And then in high school and then again in college. And then again, as a young adult, whatever people kept trying to say, so we're going to do a cool new mass. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to do a, a praise thing with a guitar and some stuff and you know on the one hand cool like yes there are times when I wish that the Episcopal Church could get a little bit more ecstatic in its worship like there are times when I'm like it doesn't have to be a dirge folks like we can speed this up it's okay like um but on the other hand it just because I was an 18 year old person didn't mean that I didn't want to use the prayer book and the hymnal and, you know, be in a very traditional mass. Um, To me, assuming that 
that was what I would want would be this other thing over there with okay. guitars and, you know, creative liturgy or whatever mm-hmm. is kind of hurtful and offensive. And it makes me feel like, well, should I not like this other thing? Like, am I not in the right place or am I not welcome at this other thing? Cause I'm young. And, um, and I think, but at the same time they were doing that because there were people that wanted that, right. There are, there were people that wanted guitars and a creative mass and whatever, and they wanted to do their thing. And that's fine. I'm not judging them. It's just not my thing, right? So it's fine to me for a parish to say, we have a sensory friendly mass and to offer some other like other way that's a smaller group that's in a smaller area or and it's quieter and they change the lighting and they do it. That's fine. But I think the the emphasis has to be if this is completely optional and you are still welcome at the main service. You are you are part of this body. And you are part of this community. We have this other thing if you want it, but you don't have to. You can still be yourself and be with us over here. Mm-hmm. I think something that you know a lot of people have lots of stereotypes about autistic people, but one thing that is in the diagnostic criteria and that is acknowledged is this kind of wanting to have routines and rituals. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something that feels really safe about going to church and knowing that there's going to be the same routine and the same ritual Mm -hmm. that happens every week. And I think feeling that safety that comes with consistency, Mm -hmm. but not having the pressure that comes with really rigid expectations and the feeling like things can't change. Mm -hmm. I think it's a balance that you have to strike and it's going to come out different depending on what the church is, depending on who's there, depending on a lot of different things. But as long as you're having those conversations to think about what are the things that make sense for us to change because there are needs and what are the things that we do want to, you know, keep close to us and keep the same because it provides that consistency. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, I was the same way. I hated when they brought in the guitars. I hated when they lowered. (laughs) I I didn't like it. I liked the the same hymns that they'd been singing from the (laughs) foreign and started going to my Methodist church. Yes. Uh, because that was consistent for me. Mm-hmm. And so it took me time to get used to the other things. Right. And it took me time to get used to when there was a new pastor. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's another piece is that I found when, when churches can allow for transition periods, when there are changes mm-hmm. to be able to l- communicate and let people know what's going on. Also, a lot of times, you know, we miss social cues. We don't necessarily pick up on all of what's happening behind the scenes. So if people are talking and gossiping about things behind closed doors about something we might not necessarily get that information or it might be, feel really stressful so i think yeah. clear like very open communication around certain topics is really really helpful and effective as well yeah yeah i think i think there's a few of my own experiences that kind of correspond with what people have given here because i know a few years ago i was well into my 30s at this point and i was talking to my mom and she remembered when we went to my grandpa's parish when i was a kid and it was like a a six month old, a year old, I started just screaming my, my head off because, you know, I'm a six month old and that's what six months old do sometimes. And the pastor stopped in the middle of the church and said, get that baby out of here. And she remembered it like 30 some years later. And she's like, this was like the worst experience I had in church, you know, so that, so people remember those things a lot. Like obviously as a six month old, I don't remember it at all. Uh, I do remember my grandpa's church, but like it was probably a different past by the time I remember anything at, at grandpa's church because uh, and things. And then, and then also like, I know when I was in college, I went to different things and I once went to like a kind of ecumenical thing that was run by more evangelical types. And the kind of like, you never knew which was next was like, drove me crazy. I didn't think of it as autism at the time. It was just like, you never knew what was next and it drove me crazy. Whereas even it wasn't so much the guitars because I know like the Catholic campus ministry where I was, they would do like Friday praise and worship where they would just have like, you know, two people on unplugged guitars. So it was like, and it was, you know, with 30 people. So it was, it was a reasonable volume. And, you know, we'd sing, we'd do a praise and worship for 45 minutes. Then we'd, you know, play board games for an hour or something, you know, classic campus ministry type thing. And that worked out because it was kind of a consistent one. Okay. We're going to sing for 45 minutes. Then we're going to play Pictionary for an hour or whatever else and things. And then going back to, uh, I think Michelle brought it up uh, about uh, the the idea of not just like that main accept that first level acceptance, but I think the next level is really finding roles in ministry, like she was talking about ushers and things like that. Because I think that for us, for anyone, 
it's it's not just to like, hey, they're minister too, but they become the ministers. Right. And and I know uh, Bob Quinlan, who I don't, I think he's retired now. He used to be with the National Catholic Partnership for Disability. I th- yeah, I think he's retired by now. Uh, I right when I was diagnosed, so I had I was at uh, I had filmed a video of like a Catholic event, and he had, and I was asking him like how to better live the social doctrine of the church. And one of them was him talking about this. And then I filmed that, and then like five days later, I edited it. But in those five days, I got my formal doctor's diagnosis. So like, it was very different watching his his responses. You know, even though it was five days later, because I just got got my own like you know my own diagnosis in that sense, where where I realized you know it's I realized that yes, it's not just that we are able to you know, get to mass and we're minister too, but autistic people need to become the ministers and to find those things where we have the skills or, or other things like that. Like for myself, uh, you know, being a university professor or something that very much matches where I don't have to, you know, I don't need much of a, as far as accommodations from the university, I don't have to be like constantly, you know, fighting overwhelm, sensory overload, or constantly misreading, like constantly misreading student, people's cues that makes problems and things like that. And so my autism diagnosis was part of what led me after, like I was diagnosed as a priest, I should mention that, uh, led me to uh, becoming uh, a professor in that as a ministry, as a priestly ministry. So in that sense, because it was realization of that, and then say, okay, what kind of role that priests usually do best fits the skill sets, knowing you're autistic and, you know, maybe going back to a parish, going back into uh, youth ministry or going back in, or going into like spiritual direction is probably not the best fit for, mm-hmm. for your kind of, for you in a situation like that, uh, because you're going to make, I'm likely to make a lot of, require a lot of downtime to catch up, you know, from all the overload or require, you know, or require a lot of accommodation or, or make a lot of mistakes and things like that. Whereas here I can really, I'm really able to flourish much better uh, because of that self knowledge, it came with the diagnosis in that sense. Yeah, what you're talking about reminds me a lot of when when I'm working in public health and public safety initiatives. A lot of the time, if you're at you know government tables where they're bringing people together to talk about whatever the issue is, a lot of this time they'll say we need to talk to people with lived experience, mm-hmm. and it's always in the us and them mm-hmm. thing. And I talked to several, you know, several other people in many different circumstances where it's like, but we're also here. Like it's also us. And I think it's can be really hard when everyone is assuming that there aren't people with mental health issues. Mm-hmm. There aren't people who are autistic. There aren't people with substance use disorders or in recovery who are already at the table. Then it can be really hard to, to like raise your hand and say, oh, that's me actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's, it's around about the language and about the assumptions about making it welcoming for people to share their own experiences when they're in those positions of leadership. I think finding, finding a way, finding a way to yes for people is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so if you have, if you have someone who says, I really want to um, be a reader, but I'm, I can't, I can't do it with under these circumstances or there's, you know, I need the reading three weeks in advance so that I can prepare for it. Like find, find a way to, to make it work, you know, find a way to, to say yes to that and find a way to, to let people know that that's a possibility, that if they want to do something that the parish will support trying to figure out a way to let them do it, um, and not, n- not just be an immediate, like, well, no, we can't, sorry, we, you know, we don't, we can't do yeah. it that part of the answer. We can't, you know, you can't, you can't be an usher if you can't like look people in the eye and say good morning. Like you, you can't, you know, um, th- there are ways, and I think that there are ways to include people. And I think if you start from a place of yes, rather than a place of no, that you're going to get a lot farther in figuring out and not everybody is going to be able to do every task and that's okay. But starting out from the position of, well, what if, what if we could, you know, what would it look like to make this happen and how would we have to get there? Um, I think that's a, a first step is just to change the mindset. The other piece I think is that realizing that, um, 
autism is a spectrum. <laughs> you know, so you have, you're going to have people who are very obviously autistic, right? And then you have the people involved in this panel, right? Where like no one would look at us and say, no, that's <laughs> right there, that's definitely an autistic person, right? Um and I think it's valuable with any interaction, and I know I said this earlier, any interaction with someone and to come into it with a certain sense of humility because you never know exactly what's going on with someone, right? So if they say, I I want to be, I want to get involved with the vestry, but I'm really nervous about speaking in groups and I I just, is there any way that I can do it, but I don't necessarily have to like ever get up in front of the congregation or something like that. You know, if there, there's something, they, they don't, don't require them to then say, because I have severe anxiety and I am an autistic individual and therefore I am requesting this accommodation. They shouldn't have to disclose it, right? Just right. start from yes, decide that they have a reason for asking the thing they're asking you and go from there. Yeah, I, I think it's really about trusting people. Yeah. Because I, one of the gifts I think of being able to talk about being autistic is to have a shared language and to say, oh, like when you were talking about um, being really clumsy as a kid, like I've always been clumsy and like, it's never gotten to the point of like serious injury, <laughs> but like people would definitely comment about it. And thankfully, mostly my, my, most of my family comments in a loving way and we have a playful thing around it, but I always felt weird about it. And I always felt like, oh yeah, I'm just this clumsy person. And now I have terms like proprioception and interoception and all of these other things to be able to talk about this stuff. But I think recognizing that a lot of the time, like that's an ongoing learning process, even for people who are diagnosed. And so if someone says, I don't really, I can't really put to words why I want this thing, but I, I want this thing and it's important to me, like letting that be enough. Earlier in the conversation, there was a point where one of you raised the language of accommodation. And I found myself thinking, is accommodation really exactly the right thing or is an accommodation enough? Because I guess, I guess my fear with accommodation is if accom accommodation maybe by itself is something that can function as an exception that doesn't necessarily challenge the norms that are in place in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um and what I feel like I hear you all talking about is something that goes beyond simply having there be a condition that requires one exception, one accommodation to sort of move someone toward fitting as close into the norm that was there as possible. Um, and instead sort of, I don't know, having enough grace or enough sort of expansiveness in your understanding of what it means to, to be a leader, to be part of a community, to, um, to be a, an active and, and like worthy participant in a community that you're you're moving beyond simply accommodating someone for falling short of your narrow standard and instead broadening your standard into something that's that's different yeah well and i think there's a difference in accommodation uh you know like if you're dealing with you know something that's very particular and something that's more general if that makes sense, like, like, I, like, because I, I, I think I mentioned accommodation. I don't need much accommodation being a professor, but let's say I was at some other job, and they had a chair that was good for most people, and then they just assigned that, and that was like the chair that they used just for to be, you know, you know, nice, and like 99 percent of the people was fine, and the one person's like, no, I need this other chair because of whatever else, and you know, like legally they have to they have to allow that if there's you know if there's a valid reason according to the ADA. And, you know, and I think that there's something like that or somebody who's who needs something very specific in the church. Like I remember re talking to one of the people running a uh, sensory friendly mass. And for one person, the flicker of flames just bothered them a lot of like of candle flames, sort of little tiny, tiny flames. which usually like even for most autistic people are not a bothersome source of light. So they had to accommodate that person and how they did the liturgy there. But I wouldn't say everybody does sensory friendly mass has to use electric candles because that that among even people who need a sensory friendly mass or a sensor, you know, whether it's at a parish or in a, for a for for a parish or for a diocese, that's going to be like a very narrow. Even in that group, it's going to be a small number who need that specific 
thing, whereas there is kind of more general things you can do that 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 help a whole bunch of people. If that makes sense, at least that's how I would how I would view it. Is that distinction between like what's going to help a whole bunch and what's going to help like a very very narrow structure, and you have to make exception. You you make an exception for them, but you don't you don't have to like change everything you do for a one in a million case. <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree. I think there are some best practices that would be helpful yeah. for kind of instituting across the board that would make things more helpful, not just for autistics, but also for everybody. <laughs> then I think it's helpful to kind of like see examples of what are some mm -hmm. of those minute, like really individualized things, because even if it's not the candles, maybe some thinking about candles makes somebody think of oh, but that one light that's right there that like they never used to turn on, but now they're turning on, that's what's bothering me. Mm. Like people make fun of of TikTok and people finding <laughs> out different information on TikTok, but it's really a, a widespread availability of experiences of autistic people talking about what it's like to live in their bodies and navigate the world. And so you get lots of different examples of things that people identify as relating to their autism that then spark and allow you to think, oh, I don't have exactly this thing, but I understand the reason why they talked about this thing. And I, that leads to this. Mm -hmm. So being able to like talk about those examples and say, these are the kinds of accommodations that we would make if someone asked for it and needed it, I think is really helpful. I think it can be really overwhelming um, when you first start to think about changing your parish structure, changing your programming. Um, and, and you're right, so many people, like there's so many different kinds of needs that are out there um, trying to figure out how to help everyone all at once. You just throw your hands up and you know you say, well, okay, I'm just gonna do the bare minimum, right? Um, there's, there's a lot of times where I talk to people and well, the, the, you know, we're not required by law to do this because we're a nonprofit, blah, blah, blah. You know, well, what we're not required to do by law, we're required to do by love. Yeah. Right. And, and I mean, like, that's really what this is all about. Right. Um, and uh, Mother Teresa, see, you know, just love the person in front of you. I think the enemy wants to distract us by, you know, all of these different thoughts and all of these different accommodations and you have to do this and you have to do that. If you offend someone, you'll get canceled, right? Um, love is messy. Love is really, really messy. And we can't be afraid of the mess. If we focus on loving the person in front of us and if we can try to all just know that we're trying to do our best, you know, and if we make a mistake, apologize, right? Right. But if we can love the people in front of us, love the people in our immediate community, we're going to learn and we're going to change that one thing. And then we're going to learn something else to change. And, and it's going to slowly build and grow and the community is going to be formed. And, and I think that it really does start with that change of attitude to say, yes, let's figure out a way to make this happen. How can this realistically, you know, change in our parish to, to help you become a more um, welcomed member of the parish because you're important. And one person not being welcomed, it diminishes the body. This conversation explored different theological and scientific accounts of what it means for human beings to flourish, what it means for autistic human beings in particular to flourish and what sorts of impediments interfere with flourishing. To hear more from our panelists about the ways that Christian churches can support autistic flourishing, I encourage you to watch for our next video, Autistic Flourishing and the Church. Thank you for joining us.